Welcome to Haskell Hall at the Episcopal Church of the Redeemer in uh, Tech Drive on Rust in Ruston, Louisiana, in the United States. This is this is one out of uh, out of uh, eight sessions, and you can see this is our this is our schedule, um, and uh, today's um, today's segment is called OMG: The Book of Revelation. Uh, and that does not refer to anything in his in Fred's book. Um, but anyway, this is the book by Frederick Schmidt, um, and this was the first volume published in the series of which he was the editor. Um, and uh, our Anglican Association of Biblical Scholars study series is by AABS. I'm the secretary treasurer of AABS, and so I know everybody because I take their money. But uh, anyway, Fred was the author, uh, is the author of this book and one other, and is the editor of the series. Um, his Doctor of Philosophy degree is in New Testament from Oxford. Um, I would imagine that he studied with George Caird, and I think he's probably studied with Geza Vermesh and Ed Sanders and that bunch. Um, and uh, he was certainly well trained as a New Testament scholar and uh, has become also a spiritual director, seminary teacher, and, and now um, a parish priest. And so he is vice rector of the church in Brentwood, Tennessee. So you can see that uh, we'll, this is, this is a, um, an introductory session, not really referring to anything in his book per se. And then we'll go the next one on September 15th will be about chapter one and the next one chapter two and going sequentially through the six chapters. Um, and I'm intending to present today and three more, Revelation as Roadmap, Revelation as Myth, and Revelation as History. Um, and then I'm hoping that I can um, inv inveigle uh, some of you to maybe one or two of you to do a presentation of the next three chapters, which is where he actually goes through the book of Revelation sequentially. So uh, the first three chapters, uh, the roadmap chapter, the myth chapter, and the history chapter are essentially about how not to interpret the book of Revelation. And then the one on Revelation as history is the one is essentially how to um, interpret the book of Revelation. And so he really, um, he really has focused very heavily on methodology because if you have a different methodology or a different method that you use or different methods that you use, you come out with different conclusions about what the, even what the book of Revelation says and, ass and assuredly what the book of Revelation means. And so method is very, very important. And so um, that's the reason for the three chapters on method. Um, oh my God, the book of Revelation. Um, the phrase, the book of Revelation, and some people incorrectly say the book of Revelations. And if they say the book of Revelations, kindly correct them. Um, it evokes many visceral and usually negative reactions among many Christians and among many others. And the book of Revelation just scares some people. And there are people among your family and friends who are scared of the book of Revelation and of the judgment that it talks about. Uh, you know people who are scared of the book of Revelation. And because most people really don't know what to do with the book of Revelation, many, many mainline Christians, including many, many um, very well-educated Episcopalians, choose to ignore it. Um, some people believe the only thing that's really real is, are the Gospels, and then St. Paul got everything wrong. Well, I don't deal with those people. It's not worth messing with those people. Um, but then the book of Revelation is even further away um, from the, um, the Jesus that a lot of people believe in. And so a lot of people, unfortunately, in the Episcopal Church, we have not done anywhere near the job that we need to have done of really... Uh, training people in the Christian faith, including the Bible. We have done such a poor job of it. Ironically, when some Episcopalians get interested in the Bible, they start going elsewhere to learn about the Bible rather than in the Episcopal Church. And uh, 
I, I, as a priest of the Episcopal Church for the last 42 and a half years, um, I think that we clergy need to be held responsible for that. So a lot of people prefer gentle Jesus, meek and mild, the Jesus of children's songs and the Jesus of, of Bible study books for uh, eight-year-olds. But we're not eight-year-olds. Um, one of the things that people don't get is the fact that the book of Revelation, the Revelation to John, although the Greek title is the Revelation of John, but the Revelation to John is of a different genre of literature than either the Gospels or the letters in the New Testament. The literary characteristics of the book of uh, Revelation show that it, it has affinities with letters, actually. Uh, Gene Boring's commentary has argued that it is actually like a letter. I'm not really convinced of that. But um, I think it's a lot closer to the books of the prophets of the Old Testament. And of course, it is very close indeed to the book of Daniel. By the way, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, like the book of Revelation in the New Testament, is an apocalypse. This is a particular genre of literature in which there is a special revelation to the reader about people and events which are otherwise unable to be seen or understood. Frequently, apocalypses have a heavenly tour guide, an otherworldly tour guide, and very frequently they give an apocalyptic timetable for what is going to happen in the future. And usually there is a separation of people in the world into the good people, that means the people who are doing the religion in the right way, and the evil people. And usually, revelation, uh, apocalypses, witness to the idea that there is a war going on between good and evil. It's about the war between good and evil, and what is going to happen in the future in that war between good and evil. Um, in the book, Apocalypse, the Morphology of a Genre, um, uh, there was, SBL uh, has a experimental journal of biblical studies and issue 14 of the journal Semea uh, in 1979 um, just blew everything else out of the water because the SBL group that studied the genre of apocalypse came up with this agreed upon definition of an apocalypse as follows. Apocalypse is a genre of revelatory literature with a narrative framework, it tells a story, in which a revelation is mediated by an otherworldly being to a human recipient, disclosing a transcendent reality which is both temporal, in other words, there's gonna be salvation in the future, and spatial insofar as it involves another supernatural world. Uh, and you can find all of those things in the book of Revelation. And so these articles in Semea 14 um, were from the apocalypse group of the SBL genres project. And so notice that it's not telling you about apocalyptic theology. It's telling you what an apocalypse is. In other words, a type of literature, a genre of literature. And so the S that SBL group, including John Collins and including Adela Yarber Collins, as well as others, advocated a literary definition of apocalypses rather than a theological understanding of a particular apocalypse such as the revelation to John or Daniel or any of the others. And so in apocalypses, apocalypses are full of the extremes. Good, what is good is very, very good. And what is evil, and especially those who are evil people, are very evil. And if the devil is there, he's very, very evil. And so in Jewish and Christian apocalypses, there is affirmed the existence of God. And of course, God created everything and created the world in the first place, and God created the world good, see? So how do you, you see the big issue theologically is, how do you account for there being a good God who created the world good? Okay, why is there evil in the world? Why are there evil people? Why are there evil systems? Why, why is the Roman Empire so damned evil, see? And so the answer that apocalypses give is that yes, God is still good, 
But because God gives human beings freedom, the state of the world is represented by an ongoing war between good and evil. And therefore, the state of the world is mixed at very best. And so one way of dealing with apocalypses is uh, uh, the book of Daniel does not say, okay, at some point the world is going to end. <laughs> uh, the book of Daniel is really about how do, how do young people become, become or remain good, faithful Jews um, in the Persian Empire, see? Because they were not going to be allowed at that point to go back to Israel, they were going to stay as, um, you know, people in who were not Persian nationals, but they were going to stay in the Persian Empire. And of course, what Daniel uh, uh, advocates is for Jewish people to differentiate themselves and remain faithful no matter what. See, but there's not really an end of the world thing in view in Daniel or in the Jewish apocalypses, whereas. In Christian apocalypses, like the book of Revelation, there is going to be a divine intervention in the near future. Paul thinks it's going to be during his natural lifetime. And so there are several examples of this genre or literature that is very close in some ways to the genre of apocalypse in the New Testament. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 5, 3, it talks about the second coming of Christ and the raising of the dead to meet the Lord first in the air and then we who are alive who are left and thus we shall always be with the Lord, right? And then Mark 13, the little apocalypse as it's called, uh, the Son of Man is coming on the clouds, etc. And then the parallels are in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. So the coming divine intervention is, is presupposed in the courtroom scene in Romans 8.31 and following. What will separate us from the love of Christ? The understood answer, nothing. Who will, be defend, who will bring any charge against the elect? The understood answer, no one. See there, in the background of 8.31 and following is a courtroom scene. And so the people who are redeemed by Christ are in the courtroom. Christ is our advocate. God the Father is the judge. And the prosecuting attorney doesn't even show up in court because the judge is God and God has already decided the case. And Jesus is our advocate. Um, and so 831 through 39 of Romans presupposes that last judgment scene. Okay? Um, in Jewish apocalypses, you would see, well, here are Jewish apocalypses that John Collins uh, identifies. Daniel 7 through 12. By the way, Daniel 7 is written in Aramaic. A lot of Daniel is written in, the, in Aramaic, which the reason for that is that it was the official language of the Persian Empire. And the square letters that we think of as Hebrew letters are really Aramaic letters. Uh, and there are others. The book of Enoch is also an apocalypse. And there are several books of Enoch. The first book of Enoch is in Ethiopic. And the third Enoch is also the Hebrew e uh, Enoch. Um, and then there, there's a group of uh, li Jewish literature called the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. And he lists the Testament of Abraham, the Testament of Levi, and so forth. And so a, there's a lot of Jewish literature that was never a part of the Hebrew Bible although obviously Daniel was. And so this is the listing that John Collins, um, who uh, retired from the Holmes chair at, at Yale Divinity School. I think the most brilliant Old Testament scholar in the world. Um, his wife, Adela Yarber Collins, gives a long list of early Christian apocalypses. Um, the Book of the Resurrection of Jesus Christ by Bartholomew the Apostle. Uh, the Apocalypse of James, the Apocalypse of the Mother of God, um, the Testament of Jacob, the Testament of Isaac, 5th Ezra. Yes, there is a 5th Ezra along with a 4th Ezra. Uh, the, some of the Sibylline Oracles, uh, the book of the Didache of the Twelve Apostles, the last chapter of Didache, chapter 16, is an apocalypse. Um, the Ascension of Isaiah should be in there, I believe. Um, yes. So you can see that there are a lot of early Christian apocalyptic 
apocalypses that certainly have nothing to do with the New Testament per se, but they witness to apocalyptic ideas or ideas about the intervention of God uh, that is in common in Jewish apocalypses and in these other Christian apocalypses. And of course, you find that in Mark 13 and the book of Revelation. So there really are a lot of parallels, but you have to go outside the canon of the Old Testament and the canon of the New Testament to find them. Father Frank. Yes. Do these Jewish apocalypse and the early Christian apocalypse still follow the definition that you first gave us of the apocalypse being literal? Yes. Okay. They follow that agreed upon definition that that SBL group agreed to in the 70s. Um, Saimea was an experimental journal, and they keep reprinting Saimea 14 because that is such a useful and valuable thing. And then John Collins has written some important books. He, his most important book, perhaps, well, he wrote a big, thick commentary on the book of Daniel in the Hermeneia series. And he also wrote a really important book called The Apocalyptic Imagination, in which he gives anal analyses of many of these different apocalypses. Um, uh, and uh, he also wrote a book on Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha, uh, Apocrypha and, uh, wait a minute, Apocrypha and Prophecy, in which he shows that in a lot of prophetic literature and in this other literature, pseudonymity is often used, where books are written in the name of famous people from the past, but that famous person in the, in the past did not really write the book, but you write it in order to give the thing that you're writing, some authority. And of course, that has massive parallels with um, Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and Titus, which are pseudepigraphical. Pseudo so anyway, by advocating the definition of an apocalypse as a literary definition, namely, we're not talking about a theology, because they maybe don't necessarily all have the same theology, see? But by identifying it upon apocalypse in a literary way, this is helpful because it helps contemporary students of the Bible, like you and me, to see the widespread nature of this literature within both early Judaism and early Christianity, and especially during the first century of Christianity before what has been called the parting of the ways. The parting of the ways is the term that we usually use to talk about early, Christian, early Christianity was a sect of Judaism. And then as more and more people who became Jesus followers were not Jews, they, in other words, more and more people, even in Paul's lifetime, um, they were followers of Jesus and they were the people that Paul baptized and preached to and organized into churches. Most of Paul's people are not Jews, they are Gentiles. Maybe all of them are Gentiles. And so basically, as more and more people come into the community of the Jesus communities, and they're not Jews, they're not keeping kosher, they're not keeping the dietary laws, uh, they're not being circumcised, they're not doing the works of the law, a la Galatians and a la uh, that famous Dead Sea Scroll 4QMMT where it talks about the works of the law. And so when Judaism and Christianity parted ways, we refer to that as the parting of the ways. And so James Dunn of the University of Durham wrote an important book called The Parting of the Ways. And so one of the things that you can observe in this literature is that basically the world is, there, there was a hymn in the 1940 hymnal uh, that was written by some saint, but it didn't make it into the 1982 hymnal for some reason. And the first line of that hymn was, the world is very evil. Somehow that didn't get into the 1982 <laughs> hymnal. Uh, maybe it should have, but it was a terrible tune. Anyway, the world is very evil. And so in this literature, the world is very evil. See, especially early Christian apocalyptic literature perhaps less so in Jewish apocalyptic literature such as Daniel, but in early Christian apocalyptic literature, the world is evil, Christians are being persecuted, and it's terrible. And this, of course, 
talks of the radical nature of the persecution of the righteous by the unrighteous, namely the Roman Empire. By the way, the Roman Empire is spoken of in code as the whore of Babylon. Babylon is code for the Roman Empire. And the future punishment of the wicked, the future binding of the devil, and the final blessed state of the righteous. Okay, And so the revelation of John as a whole is very unsettling. Um, and you know people who are very unsettled by it, maybe some of you. Uh, it's helpful to recognize that apocalypses are written within the background, usually, of persecution of religious people. The unsettling material usually consists of what is going to happen to evil people after the intervention of God, or what was really already happening to people who were already being oppressed by their evil oppressors. And so it's a radical stage of the war between good and evil. And so the revelation to John was written to people who knew very well what was going on as a result of the evil power of Babylon, meaning the Roman Empire, and who had the hope of God's righteous intervention on their behalf. And then um, the genre uh, of literature that you believe the book of Revelation is written in, this strongly affects how you will interpret the passages of the book of Revelation. If you think that Revelation is primarily a prophecy of the future or predictions of the future, you would logically interpret Revelation as a roadmap, to use Fred Schmidt's term, to the events of the future. And this is the line of interpretation that most biblical scholars, like me, oppose. And so chapter one of Dr. Schmidt's book, pages one through 15, is about that line of interpretation, Revelation as roadmap. Um, and then, by the way, um, I should have put this slide a little bit earlier, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, there were a lot of cave, uh, scrolls that were found in Cave 1. Um, in one, one of the caves, um, it included the rule of the community, 1QS, which is Serek Ha Yachad, the rule of the community. And then another scroll is 1QM, 1Q Milchama. By the way, the 1Q means it's at Qumran and it's in cave one, see? Um, and in 1QM, which we call the war scroll, the very beginning of that scroll says, the war of the sons of light and the sons of darkness. By the way, in Paul, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul refers to the Thessalonians and says, but you are not sons of the darkness. You are sons of the light and sons of the day. See? And so that's an interesting dichotomy. I mean, the dichotomy is between light and darkness. See? But in the war scroll, in the war that is described in the war scroll, Michael and the other angels lead the fight in the cosmic war against the Kittim. And in order not to get in trouble with the Romans, presumably, the Kittim is the code for the Romans. Uh, the Kittim are the people that are being fought against. The Kittim are not cosmic. The Kittim is the Roman army. But Michael and the other angels are military angels, and they are going to be leading the fight and are going to do most of the fighting against the Kittim. But anyway, the general idea of the war scroll among the Dead Sea Scrolls is that the Jewish people are a comparatively powerless minority within the Roman Empire. They are, the, the Jewish people are not really going to be able to conquer the Roman Empire, you know, get real. But nonetheless, um, the people at Qumran are the people that wanted nothing to do with the Jerusalem hierarchy. And uh, the person who founded the Dead Sea Scroll community is referred to as the wicked priest, excuse me, the teacher of righteousness or the righteous teacher. And his deadly opponent is the head of the Jewish community in Jerusalem, whom he refers to as the wicked priest. And so that part of the rule of the community and some of the other scrolls mention how righteous the righteous people at Qumran are. They take baths seven times a day, etc. And, uh, 
and uh, the people in the community are the righteous remnant. They are the righteous people. And then the Jews in Jerusalem that collaborate with the Kittim are the bad people, etc. By the way, in Judaism as a whole, usually or at some times, there was, a, there was the idea of the anointed one, the Mashiach. The Messiah would be a military leader primarily who would successfully make war against the Romans. It's like the people at, uh, the, on the road to Emmaus where they are saying to the risen Christ, whom they don't recognize, he said, we thought he was the one to redeem Israel. See? So uh, m- many people thought that the Jewish idea of Messiah was a widespread idea and that it was a military idea. Uh, now we, we, are not, we are by no means sure of that, and a lot of people don't think it, that was the idea at all. But nonetheless, an anointed one, of course, an anointed one is a king. And what is a king in the ancient Near East? A military leader, see? So there was this war between Jews and the Roman Empire. And of course, the uh, wicked priest heading the, Jerusalem, the Jewish community in Jerusalem are collaborators with these evil people, namely the Kittim. And so uh, later, after the New Testament or after Jesus, there was the Jewish war between 66 and 73, and that resulted in the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 70 CE. And that is the hardest date you will ever see among New Testament events, 70. And so the basic idea of the war scroll is that the Jewish people being human beings did not have the capacity to make a successful war against the Romans. Only a cosmic war in which the angels do the large majority of the fighting could do anything to destroy the evil hold of the Romans on their empire. And so that cosmic war is what the war scroll describes in detail. The war is the war of the sons of light and the sons of darkness, which is the apparent title of the scroll. And therefore, God working through these military and militaristic angels will win the cosmic war. And this victory that God is undoubtedly going to win, this victory in the future gives believers in God hope. You don't hope in things getting better in the world. You hope in the victory of God. See? Um, now, that gives, all sorts of, gives us all sorts of questions. When do we think it was written? Well, um, the house is divided on that one. But many scholars think that it was written near the end of the, the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian. And we know that he reigned between 81 and 96 CE. But this dating during the reign of Domitian has been the subject of much debate. Um, the seven churches, by the way, if you read the beginning of the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, there are re- letters to each of these seven churches in Asia Minor. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Pergamon, sometimes it is called, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Um, and these seven churches are all in Asia Minor. They're not near the Mediterranean Sea where Paul normally is, although yes, Paul went to Ephesus according to Acts. But uh, these are churches further east in what the Romans called Asia or Asia Minor. And so the location of these churches suggests that the setting of the writing of the book of the Revelation to John is in Asia Minor. By the way, um, back to persecution. Persecution as the background to many, if not most, apocalypses would seemingly help readers of the book of Revelation to identify the situation of Revelation as being a situation that late first century Jesus believers who do not enter into the religious life of the Roman Empire, it is persecution or harassment uh, during Domitian. Then the question is, was there really a major persecution of Christians under Domitian? That is, uh, Brown denies that. Raymond Brown, in his fine introduction of the New Testament, Uh, argues that there was not a major persecution under Domitian, but that there was harassment. And whether there really was 
big time persecution or any persecution under no mission is a matter of scholarly debate. And personally, I'm a Pauline scholar, so I don't know. Okay. Um, but in the next three sessions, we will study Dr. Schmidt's first three chapters. And these are chapters that are designed to help you understand the issues standing behind anything you may read or hear about the book of Revelation. And the two issues are, are as follows. Namely, what is the book of Revelation like? What kind of literature is it really? And therefore, once you have the idea of what kind of literature it really is, then you can reasonably interpret it, see? And so my predilection is to try to understand historical and literary context of biblical texts first, and then and only then to turn to deal with the text theologically. So in my scholarship, I always try to do the historical and literary, and in my case, rhetorical analysis first. And then after I've done that kind of analysis of the text as it stands, um, which anybody can do whether they're a Christian or not, then as a Christian, I then look at the text and say, okay, what does this mean theologically um, to the history of the church? What does this mean theologically to me uh, as a priest and as a Christian? So that's my predilection. I privilege the historical and literary questions first and then do the theological analysis after I think I have some handle on what kind of literature it was and, and, and therefore how I should interpret it. Um, so those, that is my point of view. You don't have to agree with my point of view, but that is my point of view. And so we have actually um, about 12 minutes. And so I would be delighted to uh, entertain questions from you. Well, the one that I used for a long time, we did not have a really good intro to the New Testament. In other words, moderate historical critical scholars, we did not really have a good book on the new, a good intro to the New Testament. And then finally, finally, Raymond Brown wrote it. And Raymond Brown was the soul, the soul of courtesy. And Raymond Brown was the soul of moderation. He's a centrist. And toward the end of his career, he wrote an intro, an intro to the New Testament. It is this thick. And then his student, Marty Swords, of the Presbyterian Seminary in Louisville, abridged it. And it's maybe only about that thick. But um, Ray Brown's intro to the New Testament is really good. Uh, I believe EFM is using the one by Mark Allen Powell, which is really written primarily for like college courses rather than seminary courses, whereas Ray Brown's intro, an intro to the New Testament is m very much a seminary and graduate school type book. And I haven't seen the abridged, abridged edition of it by Marty Swords, um, but I'm sure it would be very good. And one of the things about Ray Brown's intro is at the end of every chapter, there's like two pages of bibliography of literature on that book of the New Testament. And it's all in English. And it's all been published since the 70s usually. So um, he was the scholar's scholar's scholar. Um, and uh, he wrote his famous commentary on the Gospel of John, um, arguing that the Gospel of John, the background was really Judaism rather than the Hellenistic Greco-Roman world. And of course, he opposed my teacher's teacher's teacher, Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, but Brown became the most famous Roman Catholic biblical scholar almost immediately. Um, and uh, he was hired at Union Seminary in New York City. He was the first Roman Catholic to be tenured at Union. Um, and then he was appointed by two popes to the Pontifical Biblical Commission. And if you're a Roman Catholic scholar and you're appointed to the Pontifical Biblical Commission, you have arrived. He was also president of SNTS. I heard him give a presidential address. So he's really good and not a radical, not a conservative, not a liberal, a very much of a moderate centrist. And spent his life teaching Protestants at Union Seminary. That's the best one that I know. And I introduced it when I went to Codrington 
Um, and I think for a lot of people, the abridged edition would be, would be very good. And of course, intros to the New Testament, when you start looking at the literature at the end of each chapter, eventually those bibliographies become dated. But his intro is so good, it deserves to be, to be updated. And that may have been what Marty Swords did. So that's a good thing to do. And then the other thing is my little book on Mark um, is at the publisher now. And I expect to get proofs before the SBL meeting. And then I would expect that that book will come out after the first of the year. They haven't told me that, but I, I expect that that will be. And so I would like to edit a series of books that regular people like you could read. And also in view of the fact that many Many churches are not going to be headed up by ordained clergy. Many churches in this church and other churches are going to be headed up by people who are not ordained and who haven't really been to seminary. And so I think that biblical scholars like me and like Fred and like others, we need to fill in the gaps. We need to give people books that they can understand. You know, and we, if, we, if we err, we need to err on the accessible end of it. We need to make it where everybody can understand it. And that's what I tried to do with my little book on Mark. I'm hoping that Raymond Collins will write a book in that series on John. So we think that this series is really needed. And this series here, there are 13 books in this series. And so uh, we have used one of them recently, the one on John by Cynthia Kittredge. Um, and then there, there's like 11 more. So I really like the series. In one church that I served, a lot of people didn't like this series because they found it too advanced. And they found that they could not really do a chapter a week. They could only do half a chapter a week. But that's okay too. So the real deal is, if you can get an accessible book that gives you a lot of this information and then you start reading the Bible yourself in a modern, accurate translation, stay away from the King James Version, and do not even let the message be in your house. Um, you know, um, uh, my dad uh, mixed paint, and uh, he always had a five, five or 10 gallon thing of naphtha. And when I grew up, we didn't, I never heard of lighter fluid. We, my dad and my mother, in their lighters, they use naphtha. Okay, so I, for the message, I, I recommend naphtha <laughs> and a match. Anyway, um, but um, there are good translations out there. And the NRSV update edition, SBL has put out this new SBL study Bible using the 2021 update edition of the NRSV. And the NRSV is what you hear in church that we read liturgically. So, you know, every parish that has a priest, every parish that has a rector or a priest in charge, the first duty of a rector or a priest in charge is to see that all persons in that congregation are provided with instruction in the Holy Scriptures. That's the first duty of a parish priest. When that's not being done, why is that not being done? I'm doing it. I'll do it until I die, okay? Um, and then after I, die, maybe, after I die, maybe I'll get to go to wherever St. Paul is, and I'll ask him, who the hell wrote 1 Timothy? <laughs> what do you think about 1 Timothy? What do you think about that interpolation in 1 Corinthians 14, 33b through 36, where women are supposed to be silent? How the hell can that work if you have Phoebe, who is the diaconess of the church at Cancrea, and Eunia is well known among the apostles? So how can women be silent in church? And I believe St. Paul will tell me, my God, I didn't write that. <laughs> um, but we'll see, won't we? Okay, so I think that we need accessible books on the New Testament. And, and, uh, and that's the thing that boggles your mind when you finish a PhD is that you've been doing the technical stuff up, up the yin yang, you know, and uh, you, you've been doing the technical stuff, but you know, you've really, you've got to communicate that to a wider audience. Well, 
that's one of the questions about literary criticism is like, what is it and what method do you mean? You know, so that is a big, that is a very good question. And some people think that what we have done with Pauline letters using rhetorical criticism is a type of literary criticism. Whereas I, I think I'm being a historical critic. And when I tell my friends that I'm a rhetorical critic as well as a historical critic, then I lose some friends, or I think I have. Why? Why is that? Because some people don't like the historical critical method, and they want to find something better than the historical critical method that they somehow don't like. Whereas, as my friends know, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool, unrepentant, unreconstructed historical critic, you know? And so I want to know, okay, I read a biblical text. I want to know what happened behind the text. I like the text. When you do literary criticism, you're saying, okay, what is the shape of the text? What does this text as a literary document say? When you do historical criticism, then you're saying, what is the historical and social and rhetorical reality behind the text that we have. You can either look at the text that we have, and I would call that literary criticism, but then when you start looking at the reality behind the text that evoked the text, that caused the author to write the text, that caused the church to preserve the text, that's historical criticism. Okay. So do I think I'm doing something bad? I can assure you I do not. All right, so you can see I have a point of view. <laughs> I'm a partisan in the debate about historical criticism. And when we deal with Pauline letters, I'm very much a partisan in the debate. In the book of Revelation, I'm not really a partisan in that debate. But, you know, that's the fun of biblical studies is you get to read these wonderful, inspiring, beautiful, literary, religious, theological texts and then you begin to say, okay, what is the reality behind the text? What was Alexander the Great doing? You know, what was Antiochus Epiphanes doing? Um, what was Paul doing in creating these communities that got in trouble after he left town? Um, what were people in the Pauline churches doing by editing his letters, editing eight Corinthian letters into two? and by writing new letters in his name after his death. So these are legitimate questions, I think. So anyway, what we're gonna be doing is, next Sunday is gonna be chapter one, the, next, the following Sunday is chapter two, the following Sunday is chapter three, and so forth. And then at the end of the book, at the end of the book, he has notes, but at the end of the book, before his end notes, he has, she has study questions, the Reverend Helen McPeak, starting on page 99 and running through page 111. And those questions are questions that, you know, after you read the book, that the appropriate chapter, then look at the back and look at the questions and see if you think you missed anything, which you may or may not have. And of course, Helen McPeak's questions may not be your questions. That's okay too. But that's the fun of the Bible, is that um, when you teach at a seminary or anywhere else and there's 10 people around the table, there's about 15 or, 15 or 20 different opinions. And that's normal.